Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have spent some considerable time together over the last two years or more. And may I start out by thanking everybody who has participated with their wisdom, their experience, their knowledge, and their time that they've devoted to this collective exercise uh, in, uh, in, in trying to come to some recommendations that would be useful to all sorts of different countries as they face a universal phenomenon, which is the pandemic, but to which, as we have seen, so many countries have reacted in so many different ways. We also have found that as all challenges and catastrophes, because this was a catastrophe in, in, in many countries, as they are, have a custom of doing, there's been a polarization of opinions, a confrontation of views about what is really happening, first of all. And it's amazing how, how many different interpretations could be put uh, on the same events. It just shows how uh, the French clinician, a very famous clinician, Claude Bernard of the 19th century, had a famous saying, which I used to teach to my, to my students in, in experimental psychology and psycho psychopharmacology, that a fact means nothing by itself. A fact only means, takes on meaning from the theory or a theoretical context into which it is embedded. So that we have, I think, in our experience and our work together, we have been able to witness that among ourselves within the larger group, the, the Lancet COVID-19 group that we are part of, but also in the countries we come from and in other countries that we have seen around the world, that there have been quite different interpretations of what is happening, how it is happening, never mind why it is happening, that's of course the worst of all, uh, and how one should deal with it. Many politicians uh, have been uh, chastised by their electors for what were considered egregious errors in handling the beginning of the of the pandemic. Others have strengthened their position, particularly in authoritarian regimes, by, by using the strategy in responding to a, uh, to a challenge like a pandemic, um, by using it to their advantage. We in our, in our group, which is after all a small part of, of, of humanity and a small part of the expertise available in the world, I do believe we have tried uh, to be as objective and as fair in, in our interpretation of the facts, in the way we have gathered the facts and in the recommendations that we have presented in the hope that the conclusions we have come to and the recommendations which obviously must be only considered as appropriate at this time on the basis of the available evidence and to the best of our knowledge, and which may have to be changed a year from now or 10 years from now or anything else. We are not claiming to have the absolute truths uh, cast in stone uh, and giving the absolute answers to the problems. But I do think that we have been women and men of goodwill in working together. And may I say that I personally have truly appreciated getting to know you uh, and your opinions and your manner of working and of thinking. Without this commission, I wouldn't have met many of you and it would have been a great loss to my life. So <laughs> may I just say thank you very much uh, to Oslo, to George, to, to, to Gabriela, to all of you with whom we have interacted. Uh, it has been truly 
an edifying experience to work together. And it is my hope that our efforts have not been in vain and that the reports that we have submitted will be of use, uh, in, if not in this country, then in another, and that they will find uh, some uh, readership uh, that will be inspired to continue working on the challenges that the pandemic represents. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of SCSN and uh, the Center for Sustainable Development of Columbia University, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Vaira Vike uh, Freiberka, former president of the Republic of Latvia and co-chair uh, of our task force on humanitarian relief, social protection and vulnerable groups. Um, during the acute phase of the pandemic, uh, this task force uh, of the Lancet Commission focused on the humanitarian and social consequences of the pandemic, its uh, effect on different vulnerable groups and policies to decrease inequalities caused by the pandemic. And uh, the task force had three co-chairs and 19 distinguished experts from around the world. And uh, now after, uh, Madam President, I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Ms. Gabriela Cuevas Baron, co-chair of UHC uh, 2030 and honorary president of the Inter-Parliamentary Union and former senator in the Mexican Congress. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ms. Cuevas Baron. Thank you very much, Jose. And by thanking you, it's not only for giving me the floor, thank you for your hard work for your coordination of this amazing group. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if we have had achieved all these uh, milestones during these two years without you. So thanks to you. And of course, please extend our gratitude to all the amazing team that were helping us, advising us, sending us information. So thank you, thank you so much. I would like also to thank the coaches, uh, Madam President, I have learned so much from you. And of course, I must say that George underlined very important aspects of social protection systems for this amazing group. I believe that if we take a look of what we have done over these last two years, honestly, we should be very proud of our results. The first of those results is the amazing composition of this task force. And that composition is reflected on the outcomes. The first important outcome was that this task force was able to publish the first uh, uh, report at the Lancet. That is not a, a minor step. I mean, all the different task forces were working very hard, but we were able to give more visibility to all the different vulnerabilities that are affecting different populations. And some of those uh, vulnerabilities, as we said on that paper, are overlapped. So they are affecting even more to certain specific groups. This was important not only because we made a, a relevant literature review, it was important because we were able to give precise recommendations in terms of policy. And we can uh, uh, divide those recommendations into groups. The first one is universal health coverage. That of course, personally, I feel very happy to have that one included, not only because we are here because of the pandemic, but also because that's the only way to get all the world really protected for future threats. And the second one, again, it was mentioned several times by George and the UNICEF yeah. team, are social protection systems. We need to learn the lesson from the pandemic. Systemic inequalities made the difference between life and death, yes, the virus was new. We had very, very few information at the beginning of the pandemic. But we, if we take a look to what we studied over these last two years, it was about systemic inequalities that decided 
for example, with those uh, uh, comorbidities. And comorbidities are there because we were not able to protect people. It was also about the skin color, about the income that our countries have, about the accessibility to enter to our health system or to have social protection. So I believe that this first publication was very important from a policy point of view, but also very relevant for the uh, COVID-19 commission with the Lancet. Then we decided to go further and we took an important decision in terms of delivering the policy papers that we are about to present. We know that universal health coverage and social protection systems are important itself. But we know that building the bridge between these important concepts in terms of a scientific publication, but building the bridge all the way to make these two issues, universal health coverage and social protection systems, a reality for all people everywhere, that is going to make a huge difference. I mean, now, regardless of what we published, half of the world uh, population cannot access essential health services. And if we take a look to other, I think, very uh, uh, terrible data, over 5 million children under five years old died in 2020. And mothers continue to die during childbirth with the maternal mortality ratio at 152 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2020. Non-communicable diseases are still there. The challenges are there and some of the systemic inequalities that, that we would like to fight are not only visible, but they are exacerbated now after the pandemic. So I believe that what this ambitious task force is doing is going to be very relevant because we are going to translate those important concepts into public policy and concrete deliverables for <laughs> society, governments, local governments, parliamentarians, private sector, and even international organizations. Uh, I feel very proud of the result that we have achieved, and I feel very honored to have shared these two years with you. Again, thank you very much for the lessons. Thank you very much for the outcomes. Thank you very much for our passion to make good concepts translated into concrete realities for the people all over the world. So thank you very much, uh, members of the task force. Again, thank you very much to the co-chairs and thank you so much for our wonderful team that made all these great ideas a, a reality for the task force and for the COVID-19 commission with the Lancet. Uh, I'll get back to you and thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Cuevas Baron, and thanks to uh, our co-chairs and uh, task force experts for their time and contribution. Uh, now we'll continue with our speakers, uh, our task force experts who will be talking about how the pandemic affected population groups with different vulnerabilities and what uh, are some of the policy and practice recommendations uh, from the task force. So I first would like to invite uh, Dr. Catherine Zappon, former Minister for Children and Youth Affairs of Ireland and currently a visiting scholar at Fordham University Law School. Uh, today, her presentation will focus on children and youth. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Zappon. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oska. And um, may I begin as well? Um, to return my affection, um, especially to um, Madam uh, President and to uh, uh, our co-chair, um, to you, Asga, and your team, and and really, as as the couple of other speakers have already said, um, you know, having had the opportunity to be with so many incredible. Um, human beings as well as great experts uh, and academics and policymakers. So it's wonderful to share this moment with you all again. Um, uh, I'm going to say a few words then about our policy brief that we put together uh, on children and, and young people. And 
May I start by saying, I suppose, that we begin and end the, these few pages, and it, it, they looked terrific. Well done again, Oscar and team. Um, we begin and end that brief with an expression of hope uh, that is grounded in top class data, as well as the shared experiences of um, thought leaders, academics, policy and lawmakers and implementers. These are the people that um, I've had the privilege of working with. So our policy and practice recommendations are not aspirational in um, the impossible sense of that word. Rather, they are pragmatic. Uh, and even some are based on the actual implementation of these in some nations and all with a clear awareness a clear awareness of the political compromises and the NGO and civic activity, advocacy and mobilization that is necessary to get these kinds of things done. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 Gabriella refers to the, the, the import of turning good concepts uh, into reality as she concluded her con as she concluded her remarks. So the title of our brief is a, a pandemic generation is not inevitable. Um, that title, it's inspired by the work uh, during COVID times of Erwin and uh, Karen Redlener, members of our task force. We're putting forward with that title, the proposition that in five years or perhaps 10 years time, the impact of this generation will not be embedded as a central part of the body, mind, and spirit of our children and young people who live through it. They won't have to carry it in a heavy fashion. It will not be a substantial block to their development and their human flourishing. This is our hope with these kinds of recommendations. So we, we want people to review the recommendations in that light. They're not a shopping list. We have prioritized them. And, and it wasn't easy to do. And prioritizing in this sense means that we made a judgment that if a country or a member state um, does these things, then the foundations are the foundations are laid um, for the health and well-being of our children and young people. And these foundations also hold the potential to trigger other policies and programs that help to secure these objectives in a sustainable way. Um, we start our brief with, uh, of course, the latest stats that we had at the time of writing it um, on the impact of COVID uh, on children and young people. And again, Gabrielle already shared with us that terrible statistic of how many children died. Um, also, uh, our stats note, note the exacerbation or the magnification of the numbers of uh, who fall below the line of poverty, whose health and protection um, services have been diminished or cut off. Uh, and the child care and early learning deficits in developing and developing settings. Noting, however, in our hopeful fashion, that as we put a spotlight, for example, on young people living in Africa, especially where there's soaring numbers of unemployed, there are ideas being generated. There are ideas being invested in and implemented so that these new generations are fully empowered to realize their best potential. So I'm going to now just in you know the last couple of minutes just note a couple of policy recommendations and practice recommendations that we um, uh, outlined in the brief. Uh, policy recommendations, first of all, to start with the youngest and to progressively realize universal child benefits, a cash payment. It has an absolutely proven impact on reducing the poverty of children. And it's a practical program that can be rapidly scaled. Um, secondly, we also argued for um, legislating for and building public or public private models of early learning and childcare systems and services, which means not only must the services be built and run, but that they ought to be deployed um, as a partnership for the public good. Early learning cannot be left to the private market alone in developing or developed contexts. And then a couple of practice recommendations that we also targeted to be foundational. And just let me mention too, as I said here, first of all, that governments and parliaments should establish systems and processes to hear directly from representatives of children and young people on their vision and recommendations for this now post-COVID era, or you know, and as we note, so, some countries aren't really in the post-COVID era, but we call for direct dialogue between parliamentary members and young people, 
and that the recommendations that result from such a dialogue should find their way to being central to not only national dialogue, but to 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 um, actions of change, such as a resolution or act of parliament, but to international dialogue as well in the UN or the EU or the African Union, and that. Furthermore, these, the results of these deliberative proceedings should not simply be discussed in children and young people's sessions, but within parliamentary or decision-making committees on social protection and universal health coverage. Um, the, the second one I wanted to highlight was the making of financial commitments to improve access to and availability of mental health supports for children and young people in response to the COVID crisis and beyond. Mental health is growing in its elusiveness for our children and young people. Uh, I'm gonna conclude then with a note of what we held in common, I think with all members of the task force that we must create space at the decision-making tables of all levels of governance to understand the needs and hopes of the full range of diverse populations. Uh, they have to be at the tables, we they have to speak in their own voices. And so to do this, we need to invest more in community organizations and the full makeup of civil society because they reach citizens and residents in ways that governments often do not. Such investment is a sure bet to pay off in the medium uh, to the long term. Um, so now's the time a pandemic generation is not uh, inevitable. So thank you for letting us present our ideas here today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zapon. Um, and uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Anders Johnson, uh, distinguished international consultant uh, from Sweden. Mr. Johnson's work focuses on the defense of democracy, human rights, and gender equality. And today his presentation will focus on gender inequalities. Um, so the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present the paper. And uh, like others uh, before me, I'd like to start by thanking you, by thanking the Lancet COVID-19 Commission for giving us this opportunity to address women and gender issues relating to the pandemic. And uh, also thank specifically my co-authors, Nazneen Damji, Policy Advisor for Gender Equality, HIV and Health at UN Women, and Hinya Dakak, Head of Policy and Business Unit at UNFPA. It's been a privilege to work together with both of you. The uh, <clears throat> paper that we are presenting or I'm presenting right now is not a policy paper. It is a paper that focuses on providing practice recommendations. Um, but in its introduction, it does make two very fundamental points. Um, the first is that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected women and girls in a whole range of areas, not just health. In fact, it has had the effect of erasing painstakingly slow progress towards gender equality that has taken place over these past decades. The second point the paper makes is that the pandemic has amply demonstrated the interconnectivity and the intersectionality of issues. Ensuring women's health cannot be done and achieved by simply addressing their health concerns and issues. One needs to resolve matters relating to a whole host of issues relating to the full spectrum of women's rights, including their security, care services, education, employment, and poverty. The paper therefore suggests that action is needed simultaneously in seven interconnected and interrelated policy areas. They are gender-based violence, access to health services and social protection, funding for health services for women and girls, the care economy, gender responsive employment policies, participation in all decision-making processes and at all levels, and of course, uh, progress towards gender equality. The bulk of the paper centers on a set of 35 recommendations for good practices addressed to governments, to parliaments, to the private sector, to civil society organizations, and to international organizations. They are formulated as concretely and as specifically as possible to facilitate action. We have consciously started with recommendations addressing gender-based violence, 
this was already a pandemic in itself, with at least a third of all women in the world experiencing physical and or sexual violence from an intimate partner or sexual violence from a non-partner in the course of her lifetime. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these figures have skyrocketed and seven out of every 10 women have reported that abuse by a partner has become more common. The recommendations focus on prevention and response services. It highlights special measures to detect and care for cases of gender-based violence. It underscores the need for training of relevant staff of services that may at one point or another be in contact with victims and of course of enforcement officials. Much of these and the ensuing recommendations are by nature addressed to governments. They are after all responsible for providing protection and services to citizens. But in this particular case, let me nonetheless highlight also the importance of recommendations addressed, for example, to parliaments. Many parliaments closed, at least partially, during the lockdowns and were not able to fully perform their multiple functions. Hence, I would like to underscore the many recommendations that this paper addresses to Parliament, suggesting that their actions are crucial in holding governments to account, and fundamentally to bring a citizen's perspective into policy and lawmaking, uh, to mention but a couple of examples. There are many more in the report. Uh, the report assumes and shows that everyone can do a lot better than they have done so far. That is true for government, and that's true for parliaments, but it's equally so for the private sector, for civil society organizations, and indeed for international organizations. The paper provides practice recommendations to all of them in the hope that all can draw necessary lessons from this pandemic and adapt programs, procedures, and working methods accordingly, not least to include women on an equal footing in all decision-making processes. Recently, governments have started work on a possible future treaty or similar international instrument on pandemic preparedness. One of the concluding recommendations to governments, which I would like to highlight, therefore also asks them, the government and their negotiators, to ensure that such an instrument is gender sensitive, that it responds to the particular needs of women and girls, and that it employs a gender sensitive language. The time that we have at our disposal, of course, does not allow for a presentation of each one of the practice recommendations, but I would like to make a general comment about their nature and relevance. Um, each and when it, one of these recommendations is formulated with an ambitious goal in mind and builds on experiences often, not exclusively, but often gained in countries who can have adequate resources to try them out. That does not, however, make them irrelevant to other countries. On the contrary, when countries muster the political will to address issues that Lowe's dealt with in this paper, they also look for experiences and examples that can assist them. Let me add that there are maybe two countries in the world that I probably know better than most others. One is my own country, Sweden, and the other is what I call my adopted country, Mexico. Certain parts of Mexico, particularly those that are located in the south of the country, which is also the part that I know the best, have a poverty and extreme poverty level that is fully compatible to, with some of the least developed countries in Africa and Asia. Yet, when Mexico these last couple of years has started to develop a care system, they have looked particularly to Sweden for inspiration. This has nothing to do with me. These are Mexican women and men who find the Swedish experience relevant to what they want to achieve. I mention this because I don't think we should feel that we are writing for an exclusive or privileged audience. On the contrary, 
these recommendations are relevant to all countries everywhere. And with those few words, I leave it to you to look at the paper in greater detail. And of course, we are here uh, to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you. We would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Johnson for his talk and uh, to uh, all the co-authors for their contributions uh, with a gender lens. For your information, the open access publications of the task force, uh, including the policy briefs uh, regarding different vulnerabilities, can be found on the Lancet Commission's website, both on the task force page and on the publications page. Now I would like to invite Dr. Isaac uh, Inoluwa uh, Olufa Biva from Nigeria. He is the executive director of the Slum and Rural Health Initiative, which is a nonprofit organization that delivers quality health care in underserved communities. Today, his presentation will focus on persons living with disabilities. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Isaac. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you to all our co-chairs for like leading this very important work. And I would really want to appreciate um, the co-author of I Have, Osge. Thank you so much for contributing to this, um, this paper. And I would really start uh, my talk by giving like a little bit of background into um, the world of people living with disabilities. And it's very important to note that about 15% of the world's population right now, which is over estimated as over 1 billion people live with a form of disability. And this is approximately the population of three continents like North America, South America, and Oceania, Australia, which includes over 35 countries and several dependent territories. People living with disabilities, um, they face several constraints, which includes barriers to implementing basic hygiene practices, healthcare affordability, limitations on healthcare insurance, limited employment opportunities, and discriminatory um, legislation and stigma. And what we see from all these intersecting challenges, we see that many of them were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And also, we know that people living with disabilities may face substantial difficulties in functioning, necessitating the frequent use of healthcare services, which we also know about the uh, possibility of, you know, of transfer of um, transmission of COVID-19 in healthcare facilities. And we know that they not people living with disabilities not only need access to healthcare, they also need access to other critical services, such as social protection services, income security, mental health care, which is very important, and also communication um, technology. So our key policy recommendations includes, and um, which I would just really summarize because of the purpose of time, is to ensure that all persons with disabilities have constant access to healthcare services and social protection that are appropriate for their needs, and to prioritize funding for the healthcare for these services, to provide the socioeconomic opportunities, especially employment opportunities for people living with disabilities, and also to ensure that the people living with disabilities have equal and full participation in all decision-making processes at all levels, especially in their own local communities. This comes without saying like nothing about us, no, without us. And um, before talking about our practice recommendations, which are detailed in the paper, it is important to, un to understand that because of the kind of intersecting um, challenges that people, persons with disabilities have, there's a need for an integrated approach to solving these challenges. And we, we, we suggest that this approach should not just be intersectoral between multiple se sectors, but also a collaborative effort among different institutions, such as the government, international nonprofit organizations, non-profit organizations should work together for people with disabilities and especially also the private sector. And more importantly, to include them in the decision-making process, in policies, in programs, and in, in other things that is being done to help them. So to summarize our practice recommendation, which you categorized part like different uh, institutions, we believe that governments should ensure that uh, medical decisions 
especially should be made fairly and then data on morbidity, mortality and indicators, indicators for persons with disabilities, you know, should be collected and analyzed, interpreted in a routine manner. And this is one thing that we also encourage like researchers to also do, collect information and data on people with disabilities, definitely to support research on these issues to ensure accessible treatment, especially mental health care for people with disabilities, and to provide training, especially disability sensitive training to service providers to be able to provide the, the needed services for people, persons with disabilities, and to also ensure that they have like good access to communication and also to remote work, especially in their employment. We detailed several other practice recommendations, which you'll find more in details in, in many of the in the in the in the paper. Um, but also one important thing is to ensure that human health is seen as a as a concept of human rights to promote public good and um, vaccines should be available with person to persons with disabilities, especially in developing countries where we're seeing, seeing some elements and some form of vaccine inequities, and also to commit to funding and integrating health and social. Um, services for persons with disabilities. Uh, some of the things that we require international organizations, nonprofits, and uh, private sector should ensure that there's technical guidance and information, especially on accessibility in the development of local capacity and um, to, in response to pe persons with disabilities and to really see them not only as uh, beneficiaries, but also as change agents who can contribute to their own development, their implement implementation and pro of programs and policies in their sector, and also to build the capacity of organizations for persons with disabilities to proactively confront stigma and discrimination, because we know that they face several elements of this, Workplaces should definitely ensure flexible work arrangements, including teleworking, which is something that is very valuable in this context, and uh, workplaces to ensure that this psychosocial mental health support should be provided to them, and uh, also definitely to improve the survey and the capacity of service providers to respond to the specific needs of persons with disability to prevent abuse and neglect in institutional settings. Thank you very much, and it's really nice presenting this. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Isaac, for your leadership for the policy document on persons with disabilities. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Sama Karabey from Turkey. Uh, Professor Karabey works as a faculty member at Istanbul University School of Medicine, Department of Public Health. And Professor Karabey will be talking about migrants with a special focus on forcibly displaced populations. Uh, so the floor is yours, Professor Karabey. Thank you, Özge. Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to express my sincere thanks uh, to the- Professor Karabey, I'm so sorry. It's still quite difficult to hear you. I don't know what we did last time that made the audio better. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay. Maybe speak. I will, again. I will try once again. Okay, cool. Um, yes, now, there we go. Okay, yes. okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, first, I would like, I would like uh, to uh, express my sincere thanks to co-chairs of this wonderful group and of course to Özge uh, for opening the way uh, for our work. Um, uh, now, uh, I would like to present the policy and recommendation brief of uh, our subgroup. Um, can you see my slides now? <clears throat> yes, they're in okay. PowerPoint view. I don't know if you want to make them um, present here. Yep. Great. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, I would like uh, to uh, express my uh, sincere thanks to uh, the co-authors uh, of this uh, section, uh, to Henia Dekak from UNFPA and uh, Özge Karada. Um, uh, 
our group uh, was uh, forcibly displaced populations. And so uh, under this heading, uh, we tried to cover uh, refugees, asylum seekers, stateless people, uh, and internally displaced persons. Uh, as uh, we know, uh, all of uh, those people's populations um, face serious health and social consequences due to conditions that put them at risk, um, such as uh, limited access to safe housing, um, sufficient and nutritional food, safe workplaces, water, uh, sanitation, um, health care, clean energy, and educational opportunities, etc. Um, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has uh, exacerbated these conditions and uh, hence had detrimental effect on the forcibly displaced populations. Um, there are already uh, some barriers in accessing healthcare in terms of forcibly displaced population. Um, such as out-of-pocket expenses, distance from facilities, language barriers, stigma, provider acceptance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so uh, all of these barriers were further challenged by the pandemic. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, of course, uh, accessing healthcare is not the only thing um, in terms of health of uh, forcibly displaced persons or populations. And so a social determinants of health approach and intersectoral collaboration um, is needed in order to complement the positive results. Uh, with this view, with this point of view, um, we uh, tried to develop some policy recommendations and also some practice recommendations to governments and also uh, to uh, international uh, organizations. Um, now, uh, I'm trying to I will try to uh, summarize uh, those recommendations. Um, uh, firstly, uh, be, be ensuring effective intersectoral collaboration to strengthen collective outcomes and uh, strengthen participation, consultation, and empowerment of all forcibly displaced population in decision-making and programmatic intervention. Also, uh, strengthen monitoring of community health pro programs and uh, promote and support equitable provision of health care, care services. Uh, also, strengthen health supply chains to include the additional needs of uh, displaced populations are also important. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, as we come to practice, uh, governments, uh, we believe uh, that governments should follow uh, the multi-sectoral health approach in all practices uh, because the, the health sectors uh, cannot cover all aspects of uh, health issues or uh, needs of uh, forcibly displaced populations. Because of that, uh, the multi-sectoral health approach is uh, hugely important. And also, government should adopt a national health systems to meet the health needs of uh, uh, forcibly displaced populations, and uh, should implement practices to ensure universal health coverage with a gender lens, uh, and uh, should include displaced populations into the planning, delivery, and evaluation of national health services. 
and governments should also identify and address the barriers uh, to access health, social care, and educational services, um, should develop specific interventions for hard to reach populations, um, uh, such as uh, older uh, people, such as uh, disabled uh, people's uh, sexual orientations, LGBTI peoples, for instance, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, in order to access services, uh, including uh, decreasing social, gender, economic, and other barriers. And uh, governments should also monitor the most disadvantaged groups and provide targeted services for groups whose needs may not be adequately may, met by mainstream services. Uh, and government should provide mental health and psychosocial support, um, which should be integrated to all levels of health and social care services for forcibly displaced populations as well. And uh, government uh, should, governments should facilitate and support the activities of local NGOs, including women and youth-led organization working with uh, FDPs, because we uh, know very well that uh, NGOs are highly effective uh, in accessing the disadvantaged groups and uh, some hard to reach groups as well. And uh, the government should also provide sexual and reproductive health services, uh, which are among the most disrupted services during the crisis situation and give special emphasis to women and girls. Um, and uh, governments should uh, provide nutritional support to those in need, especially to displaced population who face food shortages and nutritional deficiencies. Um, for instance, uh, in the pandemic conditions, uh, we uh, unfortunately uh, uh, witnessed that many refugee groups had difficulty, real difficulties uh, to access the enough food. Uh, and in terms of international organizations, we uh, developed some uh, recommendation as well. Um, uh, so uh, we believe that international organizations should support the host governments. Um, because uh, as uh, all of you uh, know, uh, the most part of the global uh, refugee populations um, uh, have been uh, hosted by the developing countries. So all kinds of resources are already limited. And uh, because of that, support the host governments um, is hugely important. Uh, support is needed for sustainable inclusion processes, a medium to long term financing mechanisms should be uh, developed, uh, including the use of food funding mechanisms to which multiple donors can contribute. International organizations should also maintain the strategic use of cash assistance and should support food supply chain chains in host countries support also local NGOs, uh, as I said just before, because the local NGOs are very effective in working with hard to reach peoples. And lastly, international organization should advocate and support um, host countries to collect and report data 
about uh, forcibly displayed, popula displaced populations, um, such as uh, demographic and health surveys, such as some vital national statistics, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, as uh, the section authors, uh, we believe that uh, at least some of those uh, recommendations uh, would be realized, then uh, the situations, the conditions uh, will be better for the uh, forcibly displaced populations. Uh, thank you uh, for your contribution and for your interest. Uh, yeah, Özge, back to you. Thank you, Professor Karabey, for sharing uh, the main recommendations with respect to the forcibly displaced populations. Um, and finally, uh, before mo we move uh, to the Q&A uh, part, we will be displaying the presentation of uh, Professor Peter Lloyd Sherlock from the University of East Anglia. He unfortunately could not join us today due to other uh, commitments, but we will share the presentation that he prepared for us. Hello, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, Unfortunately, I've teaching commitments that I cannot change. So today I'm going to be talking to you about COVID-19 and older people. As the main commission report notes, since the start of the pandemic, there have been about 18 million excess deaths. And of those, 83%, 83% have um, affected people aged 60 years or more. So that's about 15 million excess deaths of older people during the pandemic. Interestingly, about half of all COVID deaths have occurred since the middle of 2021, which is when vaccination rollout for priority groups was already well underway in most countries. Yet, and this may come as news to many of you, many countries did not actually prioritise older people above other age groups. I only have time for one specific example today. In India, by the start of this year, there was no difference in vaccination coverage between older people and younger adults. 62 million older people had received just one dose of vaccine or no dose at all. And of course, these were mainly older people who were poor, deprived and living in rural areas. And yet at that time, the national government was shifting its vaccination focus towards children, mainly the children of wealthy families. India has not been an exception. There are many other examples and you can find information about some of these countries on this website. By the way, all these countries had much more than enough vaccination supply to cover older people with two doses as well as frontline health workers. So this problem was not primarily due to vaccine nationalism. It was due to national priority setting. The case of Brazil has been very different, despite the appalling anti-vax stance of national president Bolsonaro. Brazil actually managed to achieve almost universal coverage of older people by the end of 2021. So I think Brazil shows what might have been achieved by some of those other countries I've just been discussing. And I think many middle income countries and low middle income countries could have achieved similar levels of coverage had they adopted similar prioritization policies to those of Brazil. This global story of prioritizing wealthy people of all ages ahead of older people in poverty has gone largely unnoticed and unremarked. And yet, in my view, it has been responsible for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of avoidable deaths during the second half of the pandemic. And I think um, this is a consequence of the very limited levels of interest in older people's health among those working in global health and international development even though more than two thirds of older people on the planet currently live in the global south, and that proportion is rapidly increasing. 
You can see this neglect, this marginal status of older people in lots of ways. Even, I'm afraid, considering today's event, in the 91 Lancet Commissions on Global Health and on Clinical Health. And on this slide, I've just listed alphabetically the first of these commissions. But if you went through all 91, you would not find a single commission specifically interested in the health of older people or how countries need to respond to the challenges of population aging. And of course, there will be no major UN global report on the pandemic and older people for the foreseeable future. In fact, for me, most shocking of all is target 3.4 of the Sustainable Development Goals, which looks to reduce deaths from non-communicable disease, but is a target specifically and exclusively focused on deaths among those aged under 70, placing absolutely no value on survival aged 70 and above. So clearly this SDG is explicitly discriminatory against older people, but again, this has gone largely unnoticed. Even if you're not specifically interested in older people, think about what this means for health services. For example, at the end of last year, 13% of NHS hospital beds in the UK were occupied by older people, older people who were considered fit for discharge, but for whom there was no community care in place, and so they had to remain in hospital. And we're seeing similar problems emerging very quickly in many developing countries. This is their future. COVID could have been an opportunity to wake the world up to this willful denial, but clearly that hasn't happened. This Lancet Commission lists older people as a vulnerable group, but it doesn't ask why older people are vulnerable. So perhaps more than just thinking about protection for older people, we need to respond to this issue in the same way we do to issues like gender and health. So we need to call for an age responsive approach to pandemics like COVID and to public health more generally. In all countries, older people make up a disproportionate amount of the burden of disease. They make up a disproportionate amount of health service use, but they also account for a disproportionate amount of unmet health needs and the consequent suffering that results from those unmet health needs. So I hope these issues get picked up during the discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Lloyd Sherlock for leading the policy paper about older people and uh, your presentation today. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Cuevas Baron, uh, who will be moderating the Q&A part. Thank you, thank you so much, Osge. And uh, before opening the floor for our Q&A session, I would like to invite our co-chair, George Laria, who just uh, uh, was able to, to join this uh, webinar. George, you played a very important role at this task force. Your work for uh, social protection systems and fighting inequalities have been always very important. So if, if you would like to share a message with us, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, um, Gabriela. And, and, and um, Madam President, it's good to see you again. And, and, uh, thank you, Oske. I judge the time. I think there were two links that were sent and 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 apparently i got it time wrong um it's been a good journey uh, looking back i think one can think of a few things to say in hindsight as always as always and in life this helps us um you all remember that i was transferred to to south asia in the middle of the pandemic so I saw the world in, in a different way. I was working in New York and I got transferred to South Asia. And I saw the world in a different way. Um, um, for our task, our task um, force, 
I think that we've had a lot to offer, looking at the needs of, of, where, of, where, of where I work, uh, from where I work now. Um, the, the numbers of vulnerable people are just huge. I'll give you an example. In South Asia, we have about 620 million children about 350 million adolescents. Um, about, 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 about half of these have various vulnerabilities. So when COVID hit, it just exposed old vulnerabilities. It just combined with, with COVID um, um, to, to, to kind of extend the pain of, of people. So the, um, Recommendations that the papers are asking for, I think are relevant. Um, I would have wished there was a forum for us to look more at some specific needs. I, I, I think the needs are not the same everywhere. I think the debate that is had in the West is very different from the debate that India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Myanmar and co are having about, about COVID and its aftermath about how to take care of the needs of the vulnerable. So I guess for me, that's the main takeaway, that our group's work I think is paramount and we should find a way of co continuing the dialogue, knowing that um, the needs differ across the world. And a little example before I conclude, um, is, 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 is being on the issue um, of, social protection, whether the flaws or, or whatever for various groups, including re re refugees, including uh, elder, elderly and so on. Um, some governments have exhausted what it can do. They've truly exhausted what it can do. Families are stressed. Um, so there has to be new thinking about how to how to create a different model of development. So just asking them to, just asking them always to ex expand their, their fiscal space is not, it's not holding anymore. Um, the war in Ukraine has had a, a very bad effect in, in, in where I work now. The food prices have gone through the roof. Governments are, have, have repurposed their expenditures. So we are in for a run. So again, again, I think looking back, it's been a good journey and thank you and thank you and thank you. And if I were to do this again, as part of this group, I would ask that we, we, we look at other lenses. And, and again, in this case is the lens of South Asia, which has 2 billion people. And frankly, what is discussed in the West, uh, really is, is not what is being discussed in, in the media here. So I'll pause here and have, hand over to you, Gabriela, but thanks again. Thank you very much, George. And thank you to all the members that presented the very important contributions of each one of these policy papers. Uh, I think that we are sure that women and girls forcibly displaced population, children and youth, older people, indigenous populations, and people living with disabilities need more specific policies and more specific actions. And as George just mentioned, it is also related to our national and I must say community context. So now I would like to give the floor to uh, our, I see that we have some commissioners here and I see that we have a lot of participants. So now is the time for our Q&A session. Uh, we have uh, some uh, task force members in the audience. I can see Rapsa, Miriam, Ronald. I'm not sure if you would like to take the floor, but uh, I think that we all have a lot of things to share here. Uh, we all went through, through very important experiences and learnings. But the main focus today is how are we going to translate word into actions? That's 
the inspiration for the policy papers. And as this is perhaps our last activity, well, we are going to have another session later, but how are we going to make this a more inclusive and fair planet? Uh, how are you dealing with those issues at, the, at your own spheres? Miriam, Ronald, Rapsa, I think that Phoebe is also there. She's dealing with the climate change issues, but I think that the, the persons that are attending this, pan, this uh, webinar have a lot to say. Please, the floor is yours. I would like to, to see your hands. Just reiterating, please raise your hand if you would like the floor. Participants as well as speakers, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, if I don't see any hands raised, perhaps uh, we can give the floor to uh, Nazneen. You are here and I'm sure that you have a lot to say. So sorry to put the finger on you, but as, as you're in the screen, perhaps you can give us your uh, perspective. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you so much. And, and no problem for putting me on the spot. I just wanted to say again, a huge thank you to the, to the group. Uh, it has been a real uh, pleasure to, to work on this project. Um, just to pick up a little bit on uh, what Anders already uh, sort of laid out in our policy paper. I think a few things that come to mind that are critical for us as we go forward, in addition to what we've laid out, is the very practical recommendations are not recommendations that are asking for the moon. They don't require um, uh, very vast levels of effort. Um, we had done, as you know, UNDP and UN Women had with the University of Pittsburgh pulled together some data on what kinds of measures are being put in place during the COVID response. And I think the challenge we found is that there are opportunities to do a whole lot without ne necessarily needing to change things very much. Um, you know, we we found that the the most uh, the, the quickest area that that there was action on because of the intensity of the issue was on violence against women. But we also saw that there were uh, uh, measures around um, economic security that were not being addressed, that could have been quite easily addressed around social protection, around uh, what, we, what needs to happen around women's economic security. The, I think one thing that, uh, tended to be the easiest, I would think, the lowest hanging fruit is the different task forces and how do you make sure that there's equal representation in those task forces. So, you know, uh, the data told us that women only made up 24% of task force members and 18% of task force leaders. Gabriela, as you know, it is not difficult to ensure that you have equal representation. So I think the kinds of things that are uh, in our recommendations are very practical and don't require a whole lot of transformation and huge steps to, to take uh, place and that these measures are actually quite, quite possible. I'll stop there. I could continue, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasnin. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, if we don't have equal representation, we are never going to have equal say at the decision making tables. I believe that the paper on women and girls is very good in that regard because they are mentioning the, the high level meetings and the next uh, agreements that are being discussed uh, worldwide. So there, there must be a gender lens for all, all these issues. And uh, the gender lens are only going to be built by, by us, by women. We have a greeting question from George Florin Staiku. The question is, what is the volume of the financial support and the channels and tools needed to implement the report recommendations? As all the, the, the members that were participating at the different policy papers, you, you know your field. So I would like to, to keep this question open for the, the next uh, space for answers because financing and budgeting, and, and I mean, that's, that's needed. So how are we going to, to make that funding possible? And I received a message from Rapsa Kabachi. Rapsa, I'm not sure if technology is going to 
be on our side because I don't see your hand, but please speak if you are able to. And if not, send me a message. Rapsa, you're there. So please okay. give the floor and then I will give the floor to Miriam. Uh, I think you're able to see me, but I don't know. Let me see if I have something wrong with my. I um... don't see you, but I hear Sorry, you. I have to. I have to do a different permission for camera. Hang on. Okay. One uh, you should see a little pop up. You're all right. There we go. Same as well for uh, Doctor Ware while we get um, everyone connected. Perfect. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, all right, I can see you and I hope you can see me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, I wanted to express that it's been, it's been a phenomenal work that has been done. Uh, I haven't been able to contribute as much as I wished I could uh, because of the busy schedule, but I think looking at the outcome, the policy and uh, practice recommendations on different uh, different uh, levels will be very valuable for us uh, policymakers and members of parliament. So I think this is something maybe we can uh, try to uh, share and disseminate uh, with other members of parliament. Definitely, I will share it with uh, our members of parliament and the Grand National Assembly of Turkey and also uh, with other parliaments as well. So I was thinking, uh, seeing that Gabriela, who is the, who is the uh, one of the honorary presidents of the Interparliamentary Union, that's what I was thinking. Maybe we can share it at different parliamentary levels and other levels of government, uh, which are relative uh, areas who are working in uh, relative areas uh, that have come in the outcomes of the report. So I just wanted to express that it's been a great honor being uh, a member of the uh, task force. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, the work that has been done and all the efforts uh, will, be, uh, will contribute to better good of the humanity. I just want to express my thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rapsa. And actually, Osge shared with us the link that includes all different policy papers and literally all our results. So uh, please feel free to share it. This is very good knowledge, as you mentioned, Rapsa. Very good recommendations for all different stakeholders. So please help us to disseminate these amazing uh, outcomes. Uh, May I add one more thing? I'm sorry. Uh, I think one of the things that's valuable with the policy and practice recommendations is it's not long. They're also short. So I think I find that to be valuable, uh, valuable when we live in the social, social media age, also when uh, people don't want to think, read uh, long, detailed. It's, it's like a summary and uh, we call it in Turkish, we call it like, you know, small like medicine, you know, you just, you can just get it and then go. So I think that's another thing that uh, is valuable as well. Uh, and there's a lot of effort. It's more difficult to put together something short uh, when there's so much of information. So I think that is something that also needs to be commanded. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Rapsa. Miriam, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the presentations have been very interesting and informative. So I am grateful to know about them. I think that in many of them and in many of our countries, we still have the issue of the health infrastructure. The health infrastructure that does not cover most of the people makes it very difficult to actually respond in a situation like the, condemn, the, pand the COVID pandemic. So I would like to suggest that one of the recommendations we can make from this COVID commission is that we need to have a group or a, an identified group that assesses how, assesses the infrastructure in a number of countries, I can say in Africa at least, 
and see how they can be improved and what they need. I think that we need external support for that. Even if it's a matter of identifying nationals, but preferably maybe people from other countries to come to see, especially the health information system, the data collection and so on. I think that if we strengthen that, we would have strengthened a very strong point that is currently a weak point to make us able to respond more effectively to pandemics of any kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, do we have uh, more participants? As we see that the mechanism for raising hand is not the easiest one. Or I would like to start giving the floor for some answers. I would like to start with Madam President. I'm sure that her experience is going to be very valuable to contribute to these answers. Madam President, you have the floor. Thank you, Gabriela. I, I'd really like to just make a few remarks while uh, our other participants think of some questions they'd like to ask. I'd like to pick up on what George had emphasized in, in his intervention, uh, that the conditions, uh, if you like, the baseline uh, differs very greatly uh, between countries and between the regions. And that when we make recommendations, uh, the ones we have been aiming at are as universal as possible. And I think they remain valid for the largest possible number of people in the world. But there are specific specificities uh, regionally. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a military junta uh, that, is, that is massacring a part of the population, uh, then it's, it's, it's rather gratuitous uh, to say they should be introducing a, a universal health care. Uh, that's the last of their concerns. They're busy killing people. Um, uh, in other parts of the world, um, the, for instance, child and infant mortality. By the way, uh, when, uh, when we heard that 5 million children uh, across the world uh, die uh, b before the, the age of five. Uh, we should, uh, on the one hand, um, try and think of ways to reduce it further. But let us remember that it went from 20,000, uh, from sorry, from 20 million deaths, not that many years ago, I forget now the exact number, and then it went down to 15, and then to 10, and then to five. So just this curve, if you like, of past situations, uh, is an indicator of how effectively you can reduce by millions uh, the number uh, of, uh, of lives lost, uh, in this case of children. Um, mother and, uh, and, and infant mortality in many countries uh, um, used to be catastrophically high. Uh, I used to be part of a group uh, about reproductive health. Uh, and. Uh, we visited several countries and looked at their statistics. Rwanda used to be uh, uh, at the uh, bad end, if you like, of the highest numbers in terms of uh, mother and infant mortality. And then they introduced a series of steps, very rigorous steps of building maternity hospitals uh, and, and centers for following uh, pregnancies and so on, and dramatically reduced uh, the, uh, the child and mother uh, mortality uh, within uh, uh, a relatively short period of years. Whereas uh, in Malawi, uh, the figures, uh, that was about 10 years ago when I visited, the figures remained alarmingly high. And they, when we visited the facilities that had been meant to uh, reduce um, uh, infant uh, and, and, and uh, uh, mother uh, mortality, we, we could see that elementary things like having suppose built a facility that had a cement roof over it, but that didn't have running water, that didn't have electricity, that didn't even have candles 
where a woman having walked five kilometers from the closest village to supposedly give birth in the birth center uh, was told that uh, unless she had five, uh, I forget what the, what the currency was in the country, if, if she could buy a candle herself, uh, then it would have to be done in the dark. And her child was strangled uh, by, uh, by the umbilical cord uh, because it all happened in the dark. These are elementary, simple things that are elementary to uh, eliminate with the proper planning and the proper investment. And buying a candle, believe you me, is not a huge investment. It will not break the budget of, of anybody's um, country. Uh, it, it takes planning, uh, determination, and vision as to what, what needs to be done. So that I think that for anybody uh, ready to continue this work, you see, uh, and, and seeing that these recommendations actually get applied uh, in practice, uh, it, it, in my understanding, it might be useful to break down the baseline from which groups of countries start and the, with the particular kinds of difficulties they have. For instance, in many parts of Africa, lack of access to clean water, which is a, uh, one of the main contributors uh, to child mortality, but generally to, to pathology generally. And in other parts of the world, it would be something else. So that is uh, something that, if you like, there's, there's two sides to this, to this medal. One is the universal desiderata, the things that we must be working toward to get results. And then there are the specific barriers and the specific, specific uh, uh, difficulties that some regions or countries have. And some of them, amazingly enough, can be eliminated with relatively little investment, but with fantastically visible positive results in a relatively short time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I must say that uh, the ideal program was to give now the floor to George for his closing remarks. But before that, I would like to give the floor to Ronald. He just sent a very interesting question by uh, our group chat, but uh, if you can help us to give visibility and voice to Ronald, I believe that his uh, uh, reflections are going to be very, very useful. He should be connected in a moment. Yes, now he's there. Ronald, welcome. Yes, I think now, now, now I'm online. <laughs> I was uh, chat disabled and no audio and no no camera, so I was just listening in. Um, my my uh, comment that I made in the in the Q and A was was essentially to point out that at the present at the present time, um, uh, uh, we have uh, the international negotiating body. Uh, kind of it's underway. It's going to be a, another meeting coming up in a couple of days to sort of look at a pandemic uh, treaty or accord or whatever we, we want to call it. So I'm, I was just, it's a question about any, has any thought been given to how some of the issues that came out of this task group um, might be used to inform uh, some of the, the discussions at the INB? Is, is there a channel through which some of these ideas are being communicated. And the reason I ask is that I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I was mentioning uh, kind of, I guess, Gabriola saw it, is that I was mentioning that I'm presently trying to work my way through and almost complete, com have almost completely worked my way through the, the most recent iteration, which is the zero concept note, uh, uh, which was released just within the last day or so. Um, and that's gonna be the, fake, the, the uh, basis of discussion on the December 5th, 7th INB meeting. And I'm gonna be participating in some of the discussions or that you know, kind of the, the open negotiations around that. But, it, but it, uh, there's a whole lot of issues that, that arise from that um, in relationship to the kind of financing, um, uh, the kind of support systems, uh, the kind of health systems issues that really need to be, I guess, addressed if there's going to be any effective pandemic preparedness, um, prevention or preparedness. Uh, this came up 
quite strongly in a, in, in a report that was just released earlier this morning by the G2H2, the, the, the uh, Geneva hub, uh, that was looking at financial justice and pandemic preparedness. Um, I sent a link over on that to Gabriola. I don't know whether it's possible for it to be more widely shared. The report's now available um, because that the tenor of that, all of that discussion um, was that if you, if you take the pandemic and you take the vulnerabilities that exist in the pandemic outside of the context of broader political economies and financialized kind of discussions, then you might be able to have a really nice system for intervening in a more equitable way, but without addressing all the determinants of what creates that equity or inequity in the first place. So it's a question about whether this is this is something that that uh, uh, this particular committee or task group would like to sort of uh, consider to contemplate in terms of, of inter, inter, intervening in some way or engaging in some way with the INB. Over. Thank you very much, Ronald. I just uh, shared your link at our group's chat, so it is available there. And now I would like to give the floor to George for his final remarks, please. Thank you, um, Gabriela. Um, looking, looking back, look, looking at the papers and looking back, um, I, I'm sure it's fair to say that um, these papers and and our group has been the voice that says that look, um, responding to a pandemic is not just a health issue. It's not just an economic issue but it's about lives, especially those who were vulnerable before the pandemic. The papers are clear in, um, in terms of the groups that they looked at, and overall, our contribution has been clear in that regard. So, so um, I, guess, I guess my final word would be that, um, um, in, in whatever forum, and I'm sure Ronald is going to be a voice in the important um, um, from that he referred to. In whatever spheres that we are involved in, we will continue to be that voice. And, and I'm sure that the papers will receive a lot of attention, but the work has just begun, and especially in those in those in those discussions that are preparing for the next pandemic. And that we will emphasize that it's not just a health issue and that a multifaceted response is, is needed. And currently in terms of preparedness, a multi a multifaceted approach is needed that takes care of the needs of the vulnerable. So I'll end here and thank everyone who has devoted a lot of time to, to the, to the Excellent work. And to say that, um, um, Osge, you've been a, a star holding our hands. And, and, and to my coaches, President and, and Gabriela, it's been a real pleasure working with you. And I'm sure we will continue the journey. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, well, before giving the floor to Osge for the official closing, I would like to share uh, some uh, information with you. And first to, to answer one of the questions that we still have in our group chat, which is related to the possible link between the biodiversity loss and COVID outbreak. I would like to invite all of you to take a look to the Sustainable Development Solution Network website. There you're going to see not only what we have been working at this task force, but the other task forces were also very productive. And uh, some of them were developing a lot of information on different uh, uh, aspects related to the pandemic. So please take a look to everything that we have produced over these two years as a commission, as members of the different task forces. And of course, uh, I believe that in a very personal commitment that is reflected precisely right now with these policy papers. Uh, perhaps I have to, to move a little bit my hat of uh, co-chair of this amazing task force. 
and um, speak as co-chair of the steering committee of UHC 2030, which is an international partnership working for universal health coverage by 2030. We are living very challenging times. And personally, I am not sure that we have learned the lessons. I think that inequality is there and it is still growing, that poverty has been growing for the last years that perhaps the, the different governments already forgot about the SDGs and the 2030 agenda. But we're going to have an amazing opportunity. Yes, it is going to be challenging, but at the same time, it's going to be inspiring. And I believe an opportunity to renew our commitment with all different health related aspects. Next year, there's going to be a very intensive high level week at the United Nations. Uh, for the, the opening of the General Assembly, there's going to be the uh, SDG uh, Summit, which of course includes health. And I must say, I believe that without health, it is very unlikely that we are able to achieve other SDGs. But that's going to be one. Then we are going to have a high level meeting on universal health coverage, another high level meeting for tuberculosis, and another high-level meeting for pandemic preparedness. Apparently, well, not apparently, in reality, each one of these high-level meetings is going to have the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, people responsible of delivering different materials from the very basic resolution and all the way to implement how countries, how governments are going to present what they have done, but also their new commitments on these different fields, SDGs, UHC, tuberculosis, and pandemic preparedness. That's the opportunity to make world leaders listen carefully and commit again with very clear objectives. I mean, we need better accountability. And for accountability, we need communities and parliaments. And for implementation, we need, as you all mentioned for the policy papers, all levels of governments, a whole of society approach. I think that yes, we, we are going to have that amazing opportunity, but at the same time, we cannot lose it. We need to make governments allocate enough budget to make all this world translated into realities into uh, real health access for all the people in all different latitudes. So uh, from my side, a great, a huge thank you to all of you. It has been an amazing experience. Uh, I think that we created a very plural, a very interesting and passionate uh, task force, and it is shown in our outcomes. So my last uh, 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 request is that you all have your social media, you have amazing networks, you are related to parliamentarians, local governments, um, national and international actors, private sector, civil society, community level. Please share what we have done. Please uh, let's move into implementation processes. Let's move to action. And thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful team that uh, made everything possible. Thank you so much, Osge, and please extend our gratitude to all the team. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Center for Sustainable Development of Columbia University, I would like to thank our co-chairs and task force ex experts for their time and valuable contributions to the work of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission in the last two years. We are also thankful to all participants who were with us today. Thank you and uh, have a pleasant day.